thing. And part of it is, is that there are, you have levels of understanding that make you up, but that you don't simultaneously understand. You can't articulate them. So you're a multi-leveled multi -leveled creature. And the part of you that's conscious and articulate is floating on a massive substructure that's neither conscious nor articulate. You know, that's in some sense striving to become conscious and articulate. But that can never be completely either of those things. So, it's part of the pain of being half spirit and half matter. And so then on the right, you know, you have another set of symbols which are quite similar. Um, although, you know, they come about the story in a completely different way. So, I told you a little bit about them before. You have Mary at the top, and she's, regarded, she's, she's represented here as that which encloses everything. Right? And so in that representation, culture is the child of nature. That's one way of looking at the statue. There are many ways of looking at this statue. That's the other thing that's strange about symbolic representations, because in some sense you can't exhaust them with words. There's always something more you can say about them. And that's partly because they're, they're associated with everything. And so if something is associated with everything, then you can talk about it forever and you never run out of things to say. They're inexhaustible. So, and you have God the Father who we already talked about. And then, if you notice in that image, I hope you can see that, the, the, the figure is open and there's a crowd of people gathered around, right? And they're all looking at the central symbol, which is the crucifix. And, you know, you might be thinking that, you know, billions of people over the last 2,000 years have spent a substantial amount of time doing nothing but gazing at the crucifix. It's like, why? You know, and one answer is, well, those people are all superstitious. They believe in stupid things like, you know, death and resurrection and, you know, the virgin birth and all those things that make no empirical sense. It's like, yeah, well, think again. You know, it's not a matter of simplistic belief. It's a matter of belief structures that are so profound that you can't articulate them. You don't know what they mean. And so to gaze on the figure of the dying and resurrecting hero is to understand that a huge part of what redeems you in life from evil and from the things that terrify you is your capacity to let go of things that are outmoded and dead and to revitalize them as a consequence of new learning and it's the very soul, it's your very soul, it's the, very, it's the, it's the living part of you and that's the part, the thing that's so interesting about this is according to the, to the wisdom traditions of mankind that's the part of your spirit that protects you against fear and pain because you might say, well, you know, if you don't want fear and you don't want pain you should build a big wall around yourself and wrap yourself up in styrofoam and sit right in the middle you know, where nothing bad is ever going to happen to you but, you know, first of all, that's obviously ridiculous and second of all, you'd die of boredom in no time flat if you did that you cannot be protected from the things that frighten you and hurt you but, if you identify with the part of your being that has the capacity for transformation then you're always, then you're always, you're always the equal of what it is that's opposing you or maybe more than the equal of it so you can either depend on the walls that protect you from things and so those could be like actual walls or cultural walls or totalitarian beliefs or rigid thought patterns or anything like that or you can rely instead on the part of you that's voluntarily able to confront things that are frightening and painful and triumph and the, 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 the deepest story of, of humankind is that that's the part of us that's the most powerful you know, weak as we are and subject as we are to all sorts of terrible things what do you need for protection? that's what you need you have to be willing to let go and come back and let go and come back and then you can stay dynamic through, your, through the ups and downs of your life it makes you incredibly strong and so, you know, one of the things that you could think about in relationship to this, to this and we'll talk about this more when we talk about Carl Rogers so Rogers talked a lot about the importance of listening you know, he said most people can't listen because what they want to do instead is impose their viewpoint on the other person because if you listen to people, they're going to tell you all sorts of weird nonsense about their own lives and about what they think and, you know, some of it's going to be It'll, it'll set you back, you know, to hear that people have gone through that and to actually understand their opinions if you can listen to them, well then you can open up an exchange of information and that can transform both of you and Rogers regarded that as an absolute necessity in the therapeutic context and even in the context of profound relationships 
But he said, you know, most people won't do that because they want to cling to what they already have. And so one of the things you can think of, and this is, this is worth thinking about for five years. Here, here's something to think about. What's your friend? The things you know or the things you don't know? First of all, there's a lot more things you don't know. And second, the things you don't know are the, is the birthplace of all your new knowledge. And so if you make the things you don't know your friend, instead of the things that you know, well then, you're always on a quest in a sense. You're always looking for new information on the off chance that somebody that doesn't agree with you will tell you something you couldn't have figured out on your own. It's a completely different way of looking at the world. So, it's the antithesis of opinionated. So, okay, so, here's some... You can think of these terms... Let me give you an example. So I was just reading this research paper by one of the people in our department, and he was looking at... He's found out that people are better than chance at determining sexual orientation when they look at cropped faces that are grayscaled with no hair for 50 to 100 milliseconds. That's pretty fast, eh? It's like you're not thinking about it at that speed. It takes you half a second to think about something. Maybe a little less, but 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, man, that's automatic processing. Okay, so he found that. people faces, then they can predict with better than chance levels of accuracy, accuracy what the sexual orientation of the person is. Now, we don't know exactly how they do, the, do that, but the other thing he found is that if you're exposed, say, to a face that you judge as uh, homosexual, let's say, and then you're given a bunch of cognitive tasks where if you, stare, if you use the articulated stereotypes of homosexual people, you'll perform better, that you do perform better. So you see a face that you instantly categorize as homosexual, then you're given a cognitive test that you can do better at if you rely on cognitive stereotypes, and you do do better on it. So what that means is the brief perceptual exposure activates a whole complex of associated ideas. And it's not exactly obvious why those things are associated. It, you might say, well, what does it mean to be gay? Or for that matter, what does it mean to be straight? Well, it means a whole bunch of things, and you probably couldn't tell me all the things that it means, and some of, the, some of them are things that you perceive rather than think. No matter, when you're exposed to that particular image, that entire complex of associations, which is like a ma the mapping of a personality, right? Because to be gay is to be a personality of a certain sort. It's to embody a certain mode of being. And so you have a picture of that personality that's partly made out of all your cognitive assumptions, and that can be activated at 50 milliseconds by exposure to just a, a black and white picture. Okay, so that's like a complex, just so you know. You'll hear about the idea of complex when you read, when you read Jung. And a complex is a set of associated ideas that tend to take on embodied form. And you might ask... Why would ideas tend to take on embodied form? 
and then the answer to that is, what the hell good is an idea if it doesn't take on embodied form? You're embodied So to say that an idea is useful, and you make that judgment, by the way, when you find an idea interesting Because, like, why is it interesting? You don't know Which is also something that's really worth thinking about, right? Because to be interested in something is to be in the grip of a particular mode of being And you don't have any voluntary control over that Some things you find interesting, and some things you don't and you know, you might say, well I'm going to concentrate on this boring thing as hard as I can because I have to master it Maybe you have to pass an exam or something It's like, good luck trying to get your unconscious to cooperate Because usually it won't, you know, you'll be thinking about Oh God only knows what you'll be thinking about Doing the dishes, vacuuming up under the bed, like anything, not to concentrate on that particular boring piece of information